Here's what's coming up on episode 102 of the Big Seance Podcast. Travis Sanders. I assumed up until probably middle school that other people saw the things that I saw or felt the things that I felt. So for a long time, I didn't know any better. Here is a society that's become very fixed and rigid, and we're going to send you these souls who don't fit into the norm. And in, instead of us complying with the differentness of how they communicate, we keep trying to fit them into this box. And if instead we would just disregard the box and just say, you're perfect, you don't need fixed, and you communicate very well, we just have to communicate differently than we have been, that's where I think a lot of doors of understanding are going to open up for people. You know, I'm, I'm really big on not invading a person's privacy. So, like, I'm not at the grocery store being like, oh, this, you know, it, it kind of reminds me of that scene from Practical Magic where she's like, you see that woman over there? She can eat a pound cake in under a minute. Like, I'm not. <laughs> like... <laughs> Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance. Thanks for joining us here in the parlor today. Anyone else feel fall and Halloween in the air? Anyone else smell the cinnamon crack smell that grocery stores pump in the air to make you buy every candle and every bag of candy corn and pumpkin pie you can find? Maybe that's my own personal problem. And it's probably just a sneak peek and probably a little too early to get excited but it sure is feeling like that around here these days. I'm excited for you to hear my conversation with Travis Sanders today. And stay tuned right after that, because I have something a little different to end the episode with. I'll have highlights of the live conversation I had with previous guest Ashley Riley, which we did in the big seance parlor on Facebook. I'll explain more at the end of my interview with Travis. And since the candles are already lit, let's pour the tea and get started. Travis Sanders is an accomplished clairvoyant medium, author, and teacher who has been working professionally for over a decade. His work with Spirit has been featured on numerous radio and television programs, including CBS and Hay House Radio, and most notably, A&E's Psychic Kids, Children of the Paranormal. We've talked a lot about that. I know there's a lot of fans of that show out there. In the spring of 2016, he released his debut book, I Am Psychic, So Are You. What does all this mean? Everything and nothing. Travis is just a soul on a journey with a passion, just like you. That's from his website, which is actually PsychicTravisSanders.com. Recently, Travis has been named one of the top 10 next generation psychics by Hub Pages. Hey, Travis, welcome to the Seance uh, Parlor here at the Big Seance Podcast. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you. Can I offer you a virtual parlor drink? Yes, absolutely. What would you like? This is always the interesting thing to see what people <laughs> choose. Dr. Pepper. Oh my gosh. I wonder if we've, I don't remember if we've had a Dr. Pepper yet. No. I talked to Grant Wilson last week and he chose water. Oh, that's boring. Water. But Dr. Pepper is, that's nice. So uh, I heard you recently on We Don't Die with host Sandra Champlain, and I was so impressed with your knowledge and your take on all of the delicious little things that I like about the paranormal and spiritualism. 
And you're so young and hip and cool. And I couldn't believe that I didn't know about you. And you've been doing this, what, like 10 years? Yeah, 10 years, almost 11 now. And how is that possible? Were you like four when you said? <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, I, I'm, I'm 28. Um, I started when I was 16. And I swear to you, like, I don't know if it's like dog years or what, but a decade in this line of work is, it feels like forever. I feel so old sometimes. <laughs> That's kind of how I feel being a middle school teacher. Interesting. Yeah. Same feeling. All the gray hairs and going crazy. <laughs> um, and you, your appearance on Psychic Kids with Chip Coffee, you said you were, uh, we talked earlier, you said you were 19 on that show. So you were only kind of, you know, in quotes, a kid. But is that is that kind of what got everything, like, was that a, a transformative experience for you or how did it affect you as a young adult? That show, I think, was a blessing in a way that I never expected. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, I was 19. So I think of the entire series of, I think maybe there was three seasons of it all together. I was probably the oldest person featured on there. And um, it wasn't that, you know, for a lot of the other kids, it was about helping them, um, sort of manage their fear and become functional adolescents. And for me, I had already been working. So wow. it wasn't as much about uh, getting me, you know, to a point where I'm no longer afraid or whatever, despite how that episode may have been edited. But what that door did, well, I mean, what that show did, I'm sorry, was open up doors for me. In that particular episode, you see in the second half we worked a missing person's case and they brought in a forensic medium named Gail St. John. And after that show, after some of the information that I gave about that case that they weren't able to show on air, she offered to kind of take me under her wing in the forensics and missing persons. And so I worked with her for about three years and it just sort of was a platform, a launching board. And you, man, you got connections out of that. I did. I really did. Uh, so what was it like growing up and when did when did you discover your gifts? My childhood was pretty, pretty normal for the most part. I grew up in a Catholic cow town in the middle of cornfields in Ohio. So there wasn't, you know, much to do. And uh, I grew up actually in a Pentecostal household. So we had a fundamentalist upbringing and a lot of what I experienced that was more of uh, psychic in nature I assumed up until, you know, probably middle school that other people saw the things that I saw or felt the things that I felt. So for a long time, I didn't know any better uh, that this was, you know, that seeing color around people was abnormal or, you know, knowing things or feeling things was abnormal. It really wasn't until I think I was around 12 or 13 that I started having out-of-body experiences and it kind of freaked me out a little bit. So that sort of sent me searching the metaphysical, the occult, you know, whatever you want to call it. And um, as I was reading, I would come across terms like clairvoyant or medium, or I would read different books and these sensitive people would start describing their experiences. And I was like, wait a minute, that's what happens to me, or that's how my brain works, or that's what I've seen. So that was really kind of the, the beginning of putting the pieces together. Where did you find those resources at that age, like books and things? The biggest source of that was the public library, mm. because I used to <laughs> I used to walk after school to the library, and then I would check these books out. But because I grew up in a Pentecostal household, that stuff was of the devil. So I used to sneak it home under the seats in the car, so my mom wouldn't see it, and then <laughs> sneak it to my room. So was your family supportive with that, uh, you know, religious upbringing in the house? Mm, not in the beginning. You know, my, I say I grew up Pentecostal. My mom's side of the family was religious. My dad, my dad's side is, is more agnostic, I guess, if, mm -hmm. if I had to put a label on it. So, um, my dad was sort of ambivalent about it. I think my mom was very hesitant because she didn't understand it. And, um, even as I got older, even as I started doing readings and, and working publicly, 
My mom, I think, understood that something was there, but was still sort of cautious about it. My dad was always, when are you going to get a real job? Or <laughs> when are you going to stop doing that voodoo shit, he used to call it. Because um, <laughs> I would have my bag for when I'd go and do my readings. It had like a notebook and stuff in it. So whenever he saw my bag, he knew I was going to do, go do my voodoo, as he called it. Um, but it really wasn't until probably past few years where they've actually seen me work in a public format doing sort of like gallery style messages that um, I think it, it really sunk in not only what I do, the understanding of what I do, but that it helps people. And now they're two of the most supportive people I have. And when you, as you say, were working when you were younger and as a teen, where did, where did you go to do that? What kind of environment did you have near you that kind of allowed for that to happen that that's cool i don't think we we hear of that even these days with with young kids yeah i got my start in psychic fairs little local psychic fairs usually uh someone would rent like a conference room at a hotel and there would be anywhere from five to ten readers and i started attending those events and i kind of had to earn the trust of the person who put them on and I used to come early and help set up and stay late and help take down. And finally, one day, uh, a reader was sick. So she asked me if I would sub for that reader. And that was kind of the start of me doing those fairs. And then from there, I sort of graduated to reading out of a local metaphysical shop. That is so cool to hear. So many psychics or mediums that I've talked to that had experiences growing up it wasn't always a pleasant growing up experience. You know, they didn't grow into their abilities until later. Was it always this confident for you? I can honestly say that from at least the time I hit high school, I knew that this was what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And even when, you know, it's like as a freshman, they march you into the guidance counselor, they sit you down. What do you want to do <laughs> with your life? So they could figure out your classes. And I'm like, it's okay. I got it. Like, I've got it. Don't worry about it. Which doesn't seem practical. You know, the idea of uh, making a living doing this sort of thing doesn't seem practical, even sometimes for an adult. So I haven't, you know, I don't know where that, that confidence or that surety came from, but it was there and I never doubted that that's what, what I was going to do. That's awesome. One of the things that obviously I know about you already is that you seem to have a passion for helping psychic kids and educating the parents of psychic kids. And I have some listeners who must know that as well, because they submitted a few questions for you in our big seance parlor group on Facebook. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And they're, they're regarding kids. And so I have two questions from, from different listeners and, and paranerds are what we call ourselves. Okay. John Lillies says, do you or how do you change your approach when working with kids? Are they more open to their abilities or do they shy away like some adults might? Most of the kids that I work with, um, I, you know, there's no cookie cutter approach because each kid is so different. And I guess one thing, too, that I'll say is when it comes to kids, I don't really work in the way of honing. Um, I think that there's so much that's going on with their development simply on a physical level that that's just a whole can of worms that I'm not going to work on throwing, you know, opening that door. So a lot of what I work with with kids, I'll just say like 10 and younger, is learning to manage and control so they don't feel like a victim of their own sensitivities. Mm. Once someone reaches, I don't know, maybe 16 or so where they're more in their adulthood and they have, they're making that conscious choice of this is something that I want to work at. Then I would work, you know, with them on how to open up, how to get information at will and close down. But for, for a lot of the younger kids, it's just learning to be comfortable in their own skin. Another question also fascinates me as an educator. And this is from Rebecca. She says, my son is on the autism spectrum. Do you think there's a spiritual purpose for people who are born neurologically different? A very sensitive person felt my son was here for a purpose. And she says she agrees with that. I absolutely do. Uh, autism, you know, it's something that 
I, I think that the individuals on the autistic spectrum are oftentimes very sensitive and intuitive and perceptive. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, you hear these, I apologize if I offend any new agers, but there's a lot of stupid new age terms like crystal child and, and, <laughs> and stuff like that. And they want to call them that. And like, if that works for you, that's fine. But, but a lot of times people on the spectrum are very sensitive. I think as a whole, you know, sort of the collective spiritual purpose of autism is to say, here is a society that's become very fixed and rigid. And we're going to send you these souls who don't fit into the norm. And in, instead of us complying with the differentness of how they communicate, we keep trying to fit them into this box. And if instead we would just disregard the box and just say, you're perfect, you don't need fixed, and you communicate very well. We just have to communicate differently than we have been. That's where I think a lot of doors of understanding are going to open up for people. I love it. And that applies to so many areas, I think, in life, not even with just psychic abilities. That's beautiful. And would you say, or do you subscribe to the general thing people always say that children often will see spirits and have intuitive things or have different mediumistic skills and they lose it as they grow up as you know, the world teaches them that that's not real. Is that really a thing that we, cause I often, I, I, I think back, I've said this before, I think back and I try to figure out, are there any, uh, you know, misty kind of weird experiences that I had that I can think back to as a child that could have been paranormal <laughs> and I don't. And so sometimes I, I, I want to like, you know, create some cool memories that I had of having a spirit friend or something. Do, do we all have that? I think in general, children like four, three and younger tend to be much more in tune with the spirit world just as a whole. Um, obviously, it's not going to be every single kid, but I just think in general, they tend to be a little bit more sensitive simply because they've not been conditioned as far as what to believe or what to think. And I think of it like kids are fresher from the other side. It's kind mm -hmm. of like as, as the elderly get closer to that veil, they may start to see things as, as young people come out of that veil. They, they're more, still more sensitive to that vibration. You know, but most, most kids kind of shut down and lose that. You know, I think that those who are naturally mediumistic, if, if that is a potential that exists within them, it's usually around puberty that that will start to uh, wake back up again. Mm. People who follow you on Facebook and maybe other avenues as well, but following you on Facebook, you, you do a lot of live videos and I've seen several and they're, they're so very interesting. And you talk a lot about spiritualism and you've talked a lot about Lilydale. You've been to Lilydale and we've had several guests on the show that have experiences at Lilydale and I just think, I mean, that's where I could just, I get jealous when people talk about, you know, the, the experiences that they have, cause I haven't been there and, but I am fascinated with tools and a lot of the days of spiritualism, the techniques and things like that. What are the ones that you, um, I kind of don't know how to, what I'm asking, but what are some of the tools that fascinate you from spiritualism in general or. Uh, from the days of spiritualism, I guess. So, especially in the heyday of spiritualism, physical phenomena was incredibly popular, and probably, you know, in my in my work in my mental mediumship, you know, and even when I teach with students, I always encourage them not to use tools for message work. But in regards to physical phenomena, tools are a natural aid, just because it's an incredibly difficult thing or can be an incredibly difficult thing anyways. So the spirit trumpet, I think, is probably my favorite, I guess, paraphernalia, seance paraphernalia, um, for lack of better words. And it's funny, too, because some of the other mediums that I know who work physical phenomena, there's like a, a bond and a, a attachment that forms with your trumpet. Um, I know a lot of mediums will name their trumpets or <laughs> they have like their little personalities in the way that some people name their cars. But um, yeah, I think the trumpets probably to me, one of the most interesting things. Uh, several years ago, I thought I found a spirit trumpet and I was so excited. I blogged about it. I shared it with my community 
it was at an antique store and I kept it quiet because I was going to go back and get it. And I did some research and I found out it was a boat horn (laughs) (laughs) with like a giant reed on the top or something. Uh, It was kind of a bummer, but it was a, that's when I learned a lot about spirit trumpets was when I thought that I had one almost in my hands. (laughs) You know, a lot of times too, it seems that they tend to be handed down from medium to medium um, I, mine, I, I purchased new. So, mm. but I admire when I see some of these others and they have like these old beat up trumpets with a story, like that's what I want mine to look like someday. Yeah. Yeah. I'm guessing you have like tarot cards and, and other divination type things. If it's been made, I probably have it somewhere in my house, especially too, just from those earlier days of exploration. I try my hand a little bit of everything Mm -hmm. doesn't, you know, not that I necessarily use them today. Um, but like this shelf, I have a shelf sitting here to my left. And I think that in the one video that, that you saw, I was, I showed you the dome and the card basket Uh and the slates. And so there's stuff like that. And, you know, this one, uh, this whole room, I guess I call it my seance room, but it's all the stuff that pertains to spiritualism. So on the bookshelf over here, you have, you know, cards and uh, talking boards and all sorts of stuff here. It's funny on that video, you know, you'd mentioned the skull experiment and I've read a lot about it, the skull experiment. And I think that's a um, fascinating story. And I was typing out the question and what did you think about the, the dome or something like that? And like four seconds later, you whipped this big glass dome <laughs> onto your screen and started talking. And I was like, shut up, jinx. Oh, funny. <laughs> Must have just been on the same wavelength. I guess so. I'm telling you, I'm I'm jealous of some of your collections. You would think that I would have, with this fascinated as I am and being the host of the big seance podcast, that I would have more of these things. But I do have some. Do you ever break down and, and just have a good old-fashioned seance? as the medium? Um, we, well, I have a, a development circle. So we sit in seance every Tuesday. Um, we come together, we sit for independent voice though. So we, we put out the trumpets and like I said, we've not really had any activity with the dome, but it's there for spirit to use if they want to. So we sit in formal, um, well, there's a period where we sit in red light and then the majority of the seances and, uh, complete blackout conditions. So you practice pretty traditional techniques then? Well, traditionally, there's the the ectoplasmic production. And even though, I guess my my circle has been sort of modeled off of some of the seances I've sat in. And they have been sort of hybrids of traditional ectoplasmic and more energy-based, very similar to skull phenomena. So... As we're sitting, I have uh, four people in my circle, as we're sitting for each other's development, you know, it's not really known at this point who the physical medium is going to be or, you know, if there's more than one or just one and and everyone's in a a conscious awake state versus having someone sit in the spirit cabinet in in sort of an entranced state like the traditional spiritualists used to do. (laughs) Man, if you lived anywhere near me, I would be knocking on your door every Tuesday. Is that what you said? (laughs) Yeah, Tuesdays. <laughs> um, and one thing that I like about you and your work is that in some of the videos, you're also very honest. And when you were talking about Lily Dale and some of your experiences, I think it was Lily Dale, uh, you were talking about things that you suspected were fraudulent. What are some of the, I guess, maybe techniques or tools that you are, you know, skeptic about maybe or uh, things that you would definitely recommend people to stay away from my thing is i th- i think even if you suspect even if something doesn't sit right i'm i'm always in favor of investigating deeper with an open mind you know there are strange things in this world and to even you know to think that you have the answers you may not but um there are some things that i've seen that really just don't sit well with me i've i've participated in a um they call it precipitation mediumship but it's a, a card produce a spirit card uh, producing séance and while i do think that there are very very few but 
some genuine precipitation mediums. Uh, what I experienced that day, I, I don't believe was authentic. Um, there's a lot of things that I see where mediums are allegedly producing a ports through like the mouth and the nose and the ears. And I know like historically that has happened. I believe that it was, uh, you know, Gordon Higginson who uh, aported a bird through his mouth one time in one of his seances. But, um, <laughs> Sadly, there's very few mediums of, or maybe none of Higginson's caliber of this day, but um, a lot of these things seem very showy to me. And the thing about it is, spirit's not interested in entertaining you. They're here to prove the continuation of life after this thing we call physical death. So if it seems sort of flashy or showy, chances are, in my opinion, there's there's less to it than genuine spirit uh, interaction. And so is that probably, you know, the reason, in your opinion, that we don't have as much physical phenomena now? I think that's part of it. Um, I know I'd mentioned in that video that you were referencing Lily Dale up until this year, I think is the first year in decades that they've allowed public physical mediumship. It was banned for many, many years because of the fraudulent uh, behavior and it having a negative impact on spiritualism as a whole. Uh, Camp Chesterfield has had and has allowed physical phenomena, but I think another aspect of it too is for someone to be a physical medium, I think is much rarer than someone developing mental mediumship. And then you add on top of that all of the preservatives and pollutants and chemicals in our food and our air and our water. I think spirit has had to really work at developing new ways to produce similar phenomena that was much easier for them to produce, you know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Yeah. I can hear several of my listeners right now going, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can hear that <laughs> collectively. So is Lilydale, is this a new kind of open rule that they've started with the physical phenomena or is it just something like, have they opened it up like permanently now again for physical phenomena? That I'm not sure on. Mm. I believe that from what I know, the seances that are being put on this season are from uh, guest mediums. One I know for sure is out of state. One or two of the others are from abroad. I believe that Dr. Neil Rabzowski has been pushing for this. He's a, he's a Lilydale medium. He's actually a really great guy. And, um, he has been working and, and fascinated with physical phenomena like myself for, for a long time. And he's had a group and they've been doing all sorts of things. The interesting thing about him, though, I believe his home is off ground. So he can get away with a lot of things that mm. ground mediums can't. So I do know that he's really been wanting to sort of expose people to this fascinating world of physical phenomena. My hope is that it comes through in a way that is authentic. This Next question may be kind of cheating. I think maybe I heard you or someone ask it. And if not, then I guess I'm just a genius. But if you <laughs> if you could go back in history and study under any person from the past, who would it be? It would have to be Higginson, Gordon Higginson. Um, to my knowledge, I don't know in our history, in the history of spiritualism, if there has ever been someone that has been as gifted in all three mental trance and physical medium, and not only capable of performing all three, but doing all three with excellence. And even today, we see this a little bit more with the English mediums, but a lot of times there is, um, uh, you know, it's, it's all kind of all about what your lineage is, like who you came from. And so if someone can study or learn from one of his students, it's kind of a big deal to claim that, that lineage. And I don't think that there's very many that are alive left today. So yeah. to say that, you know, you could have sat with even just to sit in one of his classes or um, just a, a circle with him or even just to watch him demonstrate in a, in a church service, I think would be a really amazing thing. I've always said I would like to go hang out with the Fox sisters and just see. I'm not convinced that you know, everything that they were up to was a hoax, but I don't know that many people really know. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I think their story is fascinating. I like reading about them and I just want to be a little mouse in their pocket and see exactly what they were up to <laughs> when they got yeah. all of this stuff kicked off and started. 
Absolutely. It's, it's funny. I was, I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, there's a friend of mine, her name's Sally Richard, and, and she's very much, um, you know, a, a big spiritualist person and, and very much into the history. And we, you know, bounce articles back and forth to each other. And she's a big research person like myself. And um, they were talking about what history or what spiritualism should or could look like moving forward. And spiritualism, we know, is a, a philosophy, a science, a way of life, but it is a recognized religion. And like most religions, we have this origin story. But like most religions, it's sort of become like a mythology. And and a lot of things we've kind of filled in the blanks of what we thought, and we don't really know for sure. And so we've built this idea of these three women who are sort of like these, uh, you know, the inception point. And some people say that they're, you know, alcoholic hoaxers and other people think they're these, you know, sainted, blessed women. And in reality, <laughs> the truth is probably somewhere in between. Yeah, that's interesting. According to your experiences and gifts, and this is one of my favorite questions that I like to ask mediums on the show, uh, what is life like on the other side? So I I have to say I can only speak from the little teeny tiny glimpses that I get in my readings when I'm lucky enough that a soul chooses to sort of reveal something about what they're doing or what they've done since they've crossed over. Honestly, I don't think that the other side and this side are all that different. I don't think people change all that much. I'm not one of these mediums who think that grandma, you know, kind of bitchy grandma crossed over and now she's super sweet and loving. Um, I think that there's a the bigger picture available to us, but it's absolutely our choice if we want to see that. But one of the interesting things that I've had happen in my readings is that sometimes when a soul comes through, especially if it's been a shorter amount of time uh, for the for the sitter since they've lost this person, oftentimes that soul will talk about what their heaven looks like. You know, he's showing me you know, being at this lake house and this is what his heaven looks like is this lake house or for another person, their heaven might be a beautiful garden. And, and I think a lot of times when we first cross over that sort of acclimation period looks like what the soul needs it to look like. And as that soul grows, the less attached to that earthly identity they had, then it probably becomes, I don't know if it's more celestial or just more energy based as opposed to more of a physical form. But I think that it, a shift in consciousness equals a shift of their perception outwardly of the other side. My journey into this whole paranormal spiritual uh, shift is what I've always called it is really only like 10 years old. And I grew up Southern Baptist and just kind of ran away from that from high school and college. And uh, I mean, I worked in the church for for many years as a musician, but once I left, I was like, Okay, done with that. But I was kind of in this suspended, I'm not sure where I fit into my beliefs and all that stuff. And then all of a sudden, I read a book by James Van Prague, Ghosts Among Us, and I read a Sylvia Brown book about the other side. And I know she's a little cray cray, but uh, <laughs> I remember, I don't remember which book they were talking about how uh, you could create your home and you just think up your home and your environment and it was there. And I remember at this time when I was just all of a sudden everything was opening up and, and I felt like I was being uh, enlightened and I was so excited about <laughs> learning about the other side. And I was like, and shut up. I could build whatever house I want without any experience building houses. I thought that was so cool. <laughs> Who? I mean, honestly, I, I, I'm excited, you know, death in a way is very exciting in, it's like reading about a place. You can read all the books you want about Spain, but you'll never really fully grasp it until you're there. So it's like, um, I absolutely believe that we create with thought on the other side, uh, the specifics of how that looks. I, I have no idea, but, um, you know, if you want to build houses, I'm pretty sure you can build houses. <laughs> I don't know that I necessarily want to have the experience of building it, but having a nice one or maybe one that looks just like the one I live in now would be nice, you know, on the other side. I would be okay with that, too. As I interview different mediums, sometimes I get frustrated because they'll each say 
something completely opposite of somebody else. Or they'll say, no, 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 that's wrong. This is what happens. <laughs> and and I used to get really frustrated. And I've I've since learned to to let it go because I used to be really obsessed with the reading and learning about it. And I wanted to know how it was and what it was like. And the more I was reading, I was finding different answers. And so that kind of disappointed me. And so, you know, in the back of your skeptic mind, you're like, well, this is all bunk then because everybody's saying something different. But are there things that you hear psychic mediums say frequently that drive you nuts or that you think is just BS? That's a really good question. Um, I One thing I, I hate is this whole twin flame thing that's become really popular these past few years. That drives me up the wall. Um, I know angels have been like the hot thing, and uh, I don't know, that's not that's not really my thing, but that kind of annoys me. Um, you just kind of call on this angel for this or that angel for that, as if these cosmic beings have nothing better to do than find you a parking spot so you don't have to walk. Um <laughs> I don't know. And and two, uh, with reincarnation, you know, a lot of people, I'm not denying it. Um, I I believe that it's a likelihood, uh, probably more likely than there not being reincarnation. But unless there is something that is severely hindering a person in this life, I don't think that there's really much of a need or a reason to say, well, you were this in a past life or you were this because that can't be confirmed or validated. And to me, you know, there's always going to be information in a reading that can't be in that moment validated, but the majority of it, I think, should be. Uh, this next question I ask only because I think uh, you're probably the youngest, hippest, coolest <laughs> medium that we've had on the show. And so it just pops in my brain. And it, you would be a millennial, correct? Yeah, I think so. I'm okay, sure. so you'd consider yourself a millennial. And, you know, we hear the term so much in the news and I work with millennials and middle school children and in pop culture and in the news these days, it's often not used as a compliment, which drives me nuts. And I've been known to totally jump on uh, people in and tell them to back off the millennials, (laughs) quit, uh, quit judging them so much. But with your experience as A young psychic medium, what wisdom or advice do you have for millennials or, or for that matter, maybe, uh, what do older generations need to understand about young people growing up today? I thought this would be an interesting thing to ask. Oh, it very much is. I think for the older generation, it's important to keep in mind that the generation before had issues with them and the generation before them had issues with that generation. There's an, you know, people talk about evolution and I think that there is a, you know, there's always a societal evolution that's taking place. Our generation has things that the generation before didn't have like Wi-Fi and Instagram and all this stuff. So it changes the nature of communication and It's not that one way or the other is better because one of the things I hear is that, um, you know, these kids, they don't know how to communicate. Their faces are always in their phones. But, um, you know, we we communicate through thought all the time without realizing it. And the technology has been making things get faster and faster and faster to the point where we're just going to say, why do I even need this middleman piece of plastic when I can just do it myself? So I think collectively we're kind of moving towards something that's a little different. Um, I also think too, one thing that I will say is I know that it seems sometimes as if my generation does not use their good old fashioned common sense, but I will say that I do believe in my heart that a lot of these younger generations, not just, um, you know, I'm 28, not just people my age, but even younger into some of the, um, the little kids that I'm seeing, I think there is an emotional intelligence that the baby boomer generation is very shut off from because the time they grew up in, they, you know, men were taught not to own their emotions and women were taught that they needed to be subservient or that they couldn't be emotional either because then they were, um, Oh, what's the word that I'm looking for with women? Hysterical. Um, Mm -hmm. They're hysterical. So there's sort of this uh, divorced quality between that baby boomer generation and really having healthy vulnerability with emotion that I don't think that this younger generation has. And I know it's such a different world, too. When I graduated high school, there were no openly gay people. And 
now I see, you know, middle schoolers, you know, two boys or two girls holding hands and it's not even a thought in their mind that it's something that's weird or odd or different. So I think that's a really beautiful thing. And it's interesting you're talking about the the baby boomers because I, in my life, know baby boomer LGBT couples who all of a sudden you just, you know, we've come so far in 2017 and things are getting liberated and, and laws are being passed. And all of a sudden you can get to a place where you go too far. <laughs> Right. You know, and they're just like, oh, I'm not so sure what I think about that. And I'm like, what? (laughs) I think you're right. And then I also thought you were talking about every generation kind of has that judging the younger generation. And I I find it very ironic that Generation X, my generation, is sometimes I think some of the, the biggest critics of the millennials. And when we were growing up, we we're always told we had it easy and we were spoiled and we needed to get off the couch and get away from the video games and go outside. And, (laughs) you know, we didn't understand how to experience life without air conditioning and a Nintendo. (laughs) It's just so interesting how we shift that down. Yeah. No. And and who knows? Maybe one day I'll be like the old man on my porch screaming at kids to get off my lawn (laughs) or or their hoverboards or whatever. But um, (laughs) Hopefully not. (laughs) Maybe we just earned that place. (laughs) Right. (laughs) What's the best part about being psychic medium Travis Sanders? Well, first, I guess I have to say the absolute best part is I get to do what I love. Most people I know hate getting up in the morning because they go to a job that they feel obligated to do. And I'm very, very blessed that I get to do what I love. Uh, But the second best part is I don't have to answer to anybody but myself. (laughs) There you go. There you go. (laughs) Yeah. No, there's a, there's a freedom, there's a flexibility that comes with it. And in some ways that's, that's a blessing. But in other ways, I I feel like I have to work twice as hard just to, you know, being self-employed is not an easy thing, uh, especially when you're, talking to dead people for a living. So on one hand, there it does have additional stresses. But on the other hand, I I think I kind of like it. I think I'm kind of addicted to the hustle of, of, you know, staying on top of marketing and emailing your clients and updating your website and then writing new classes. It's there's always something to do. I, I I'm the type of person if I don't have something to do, I will create something to do <laughs> to keep myself busy. So I enjoy it. And I like that you're constantly learning and growing it seems and you're you're doing the development circle and and you've got so many certifications and it's just all a big learning experience still i'm assuming you grow and your abilities probably change absolutely that is to me that's one of the most important things regardless of what your path is your psychic a medium a healer whatever that looks like I think the biggest disservice any spirit worker can do for themselves is to think that they've reached a point where they don't have to do any more. When that happens, those are the mediums who lose their abilities when they get older. And it's not because some force in the sky says, well, I just don't think you should have it anymore. But it's because they've changed and grown as a person and they're not willing to look at how their abilities change. So they don't recognize how to use it. So it seems like it goes away. And uh, I I don't think that has to be anyone's experience. What's a sucky part about being psychic medium, Travis Sanders? Knowing things that you'd rather not know. (laughs) Do you have an example of that? I mean, sometimes it can be um, heavy emotional stuff. Or, you know, I'm, I'm really big on not invading a person's privacy. So like, I'm not at the grocery store being like, oh, this, you know, it, it kind of reminds me of that scene from Practical Magic where she's like, you see that woman over there? She can eat a pound cake in under a minute. Like I'm not, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm not psychically primed, but occasionally I can't help it. Some things will come through and, you know, there's sad stuff with that. But sometimes it's like uh, I, a friend of mine was going to get me a thought they were going to surprise me for my birthday. And um, they're like, oh, you're going to be so excited or whatever. And I was like racking my brain trying to figure out what is this that they got. And then I had this this sort of this vision, I guess, for lack of better words of it. And I thought, if I don't do this, they're never going to believe me. So I, I wrote it down and I sealed it up in an envelope. And they handed me the package and I handed them the envelope and we opened them at the same time. And uh, sure enough, it was 
what I had the the flash or the image of. But so just little things like that. That's cool. Now tell I want you to tell us about your book. I am psychic. So are you. This is a book you wrote last year, right? Yep. Last year, I, I believe it was springtime last year that I put it out. And uh, I wrote the book because one of my favorite things that I get to do is to to teach. You know, I love that I get to, to do readings and things like that for people. But to me, my absolute favorite part of it is the teaching element. And um, the book sort of stemmed from a three-day class that I teach that's sort of like a boot camp for clairvoyance. And, um, it, it, you know, over the course of this three days, people come in and we kind of break down these different channels and then we work on strengthening them individually. We bring them together. We talk about, you know, how to do different types of reading, how to get specific types of information, ethics, all sorts of stuff. And, um, I've, I've always loved writing. I knew I always wanted to write and I actually wrote a book before this book, and I just never did anything with it because I didn't feel ready. It was more personal in nature. Um, and then Spirit said, well, do this, and then we'll work out the others in the meantime. So that's where I'm Psychic, So Are You was born from. And I kind of intended it for, you know, kind of to be what I w- the resource I wish I had in trying to, f- you know, because like you said, every author offers you a different opinion, perspective, whatever. So I give you many different techniques. And it's not that you have to master each one. It's find the approach that works for you and then use that. Because I believe that we are all innately psychic. We are all innately intuitive. Some people will argue whether or not a medium can be developed, but most people agree that everyone can nurture and and develop their psychic attributes. So um, that's really what that book is. And the one that I'm finishing up now is mostly... uh, well, it is entirely geared towards developing your ability for spirit communication and providing uh, evidence, evidential mediumship for sitters and, and strengthening your links to the other side. Love it. I'm definitely going to check those out on the new one when it comes out. So take some time for some shameless self-promotion and you know, give us your, your preferred social media and, and how people can reach you. And then kind of at the same time, if there's stuff that is coming up, I know you do plenty of workshops and things like that. How do people get in touch with you or to take advantage of some of your services? Yeah, thank you. Um, So most people, I'm a big email person. That's like the primary way. Even if you go through my website, which is psychictravissanders.com, it all kind of diverts to my email. So you can either reach me through travispsychic at yahoo.com or travissanders89 at gmail. It all funnels into the same place. Um, Upcoming in September, and I, off the top of my head, I don't remember the exact dates, but it's on my website. Um, I'm doing a two-day mediumship intensive for people in the Cleveland area. So if those interest you, check me out. I'm a big Facebook person, so facebook.com slash psychictravissanders. And if you're an Instagram person, I'm Travis Talks to the Dead. You rock so much. Can I can I move in your house? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> that would probably be just slightly awkward. I'm kind of hermity. You might not see me much in my own house. Oh my gosh, are you almost a hermit? I am a recluse in training. Yeah, no, if I don't have to put pants on or leave the house, I don't. That is how I roll. <laughs> I do promise I have pants on right now, though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Travis Sanders. Thank you so much. You're listening to the Big Seance Podcast with Patrick Keller. Look for us on iTunes and be sure to check out BigSeance.com for more discussion. International Podcast Day is September 30th, and you can help spread the word. International Podcast Day is dedicated to promoting podcasting worldwide. You may be asking, what can I do to get involved? It's pretty simple. First, head over to internationalpodcastday.com and check the suggestions. Second, use hashtag podcast day to join in the conversation. Remember September 30th. Now, let's start the conversation. During my conversation with previous guest Ashley Riley from episode 94, we decided that we wanted to do a live interactive video 
in the parlor on Facebook with the two of us chatting and taking questions from paranerds. Well, this week on Labor Day here in the U.S., we decided to do just that. And quite a few of you showed up to help make it a fun conversation, which is a good thing because we really didn't have any notes or a plan. So if you showed up for that, you totally rock because you made it all happen. Well, you can only see the replay of that live video in the Big Seance Parlor on Facebook. So if you haven't joined, please do. But I did want to include a few highlights. And so this is how we'll end the show this week. This first clip gets started as Ash was giving us an update on a new journey she just recently embarked on where she left my neck of the woods here in Missouri kind of and moved to New York some, City. Some messengers uh, the last time that I was here in New York City. And then a uh, disembodied voice that interjected itself in between a couple of dreams that told me I was moving to New York. Um, and then a few other really crazy things that the the universe kind of pulled out of its ass and <laughs> lined up for me. So, yeah, it's it's a, it's a fascinating tale that is still yet unfolding. Yeah, I was going to say the 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 journey is, you know, you've not reached the, you know, I don't know what I'm trying to say. You've not reached the end of it, so we can't even tell the story on it because you're just experiencing it. I know you're following along as it happens. It's like the Truman show <laughs> <laughs> tonight. It really is. <laughs> it was probably up until I was around six or seven years old. I had experienced a lot of different um, paranormal things. Spirits in the house could sense them, see them, feel them. I had one actually touch my face once. Uh, it feels like static electricity in case anyone's curious. Awesome. And had some other interesting psychic experiences. Like um, I remember one day and I was probably, probably, I had to be six because we just moved into a, a new house that we built. And my mom was tearing up the house and she was looking for this little Victoria's Secret bag that she had sitting somewhere and she couldn't find it. Um, and I remember helping her look around the house for it. And I was standing in my living room and I just stopped and I said like this little prayer and I asked God to, to help me help her find it. And this idea just sort of like dropped into my head and told me to go look in the hall closet, which is where we kept all of our spare blankets and pillows. Uh, there's absolutely no reason that it would be in there at all. But I went and I looked and it was it was in the closet. And so I found it and I, I took it to her and she's like, did you put this in there? And I was like, no, I didn't. I didn't know that it was in there. I just just looked in the closet and that's where it was. So it was that was another really interesting thing that's always like stuck out in my mind of remembering different things that happened when I was a kid. Just also knowing things that I'm not supposed to know. Um, my cousin got in a four-wheeler accident when I was probably, again, like five or six years old, maybe seven. And my great-grandmother came and picked me up from my house. And I was in her car and we were driving back to her house. And we came to the end of the road and at the stop sign. And she said, I have some bad news I need to tell you. And I just looked at her and I was like, Heather's in the hospital. And she's like, oh, did your mom and dad tell you? And I was like, no, I just I just knew that that's what she was going to tell me. And, and those random things still happen to me to this day. Throughout college and, and high school, like I I remember taking naps on the gym floor in between classes in high school and being able to float up out of my body and then come back in. And for whatever reason, I just never gave it a second thought. <laughs> you know, I was like, huh, that's weird. And like almost an astral travel type experience. Yeah, like an, an astral projection, like out of body type experience. Yeah, it was just like, oh, that's weird. And Carry on. <laughs> <laughs>
And John asks, do you believe it's possible for two people to share one dream, as in one person has the first half and the other person has the last half? I've never heard of anything like that. That is such an interesting question. I have no idea what I would say to that. Absolutely. Um, I have experienced and know other people who have experienced instances of where each of you is not necessarily in chronological order like that, but each of you sees the dream from your half of the perspective. So my, my friend Teresa, who is a fantastic psychic, um, if any of you are interested in checking her out or getting a reading, um, her website is stlpsychicpowers.com. Um, she was telling me one time about having this dream to where she realized that she was, so she's, she's actually, she's an incarnate guide. So she's doing a lot of work, um, astrally at night while she's sleeping, guiding other people who are currently incarnate now. Meanwhile, in the daytime, living her own incarnate life. And there are lots of people who are doing that kind of sort of work on both sides of the veil. But she told me a story about she was having a dream one night and she realized that the part of the dream that she was seeing was like her half of the dream with this person that she was a guide for. And I know I've had very similar experiences with people that I've been working with um, from a personal development standpoint. I will have dreams to where I'm communicating certain things to them. And then the next day they will tell me about a dream that they had. And essentially their dream was like the whole theme around that dream was the other side of that conversation. So she, yeah, shared dreams are, are really crazy. And you can even have what I, I would term it a shared dream, but you can, you know, time is a very malleable thing and you can have a shared dream, not even on the same night. Like I might have a dream this week about something and then the other person has a dream about something else two weeks later but in the ethers there is no time so it's still that same consciousness connecting in the same point it doesn't matter what the time frame is i when i first started now i'm jumping i'm i'm jumping to astral travel again in my brain but it's similar trust me i i got the i forget who the author of the astral travel book was but it was um i've talked about this in the podcast too it was one of the first books that i read in my kind of crazy spiritual journey when i was learning about all this and that's a little deep to jump into (laughs) as a first topic but i remember uh learning that people will create a a dream space i think some kind of dream space in your mind and you can design it and, and plan it with someone, you know, kind of in, in the physical and um, that there are, are these, all these cases of people meeting in that space or that astral space and then uh, waking up and reporting back, like, you know, what did you experience? Was it the same thing I experienced? And maybe they have complete memory of just meeting each other and that space blew my mind and uh, it was really cute i remember trying that (laughs) and probably barely even being able to dream but um I, i think that's interesting and i hadn't really thought about that for show notes including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode visit bigseance.com Just click on the Big Seance Podcast logo or find it in the menu. You can also find and subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, TuneIn Radio, and iHeartRadio. Do you have any comments or feedback? Go to BigSeance.com slash feedback to learn how to get your voice in a future show. Or you can call my feedback line, 7755-TELL-ME. That's 775-583-5563. Interested in learning how to promote and share the podcast? Go to bigseance.com slash share. Thank you so much for listening. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out, but we'll see you and light them again next time. <laughs>